Ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special guest here. We have Lawrence King, a very, I would say, versatile person. He is known for Money Twitter, one of the OGs in Money Twitter, uh, tips on sales, but also like stories that he shared publicly on how he started selling lemonade, how he was a model in Italy with similarities to Twilight actors, right? And also for some jokes in Twitter, I really like the, the humor he has in there. Like, for example, when he shares with gentlemen in the UK, what if what to do if you find yourself in the UK and want to eat better food? Answer, leave the UK. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Thank you very much. That was a great introduction. Thanks for having me, Miguel. It's great to be here and uh, look forward to this. Yes. Well, as I said, very versatile person. You have lived a lot, like 10 lives in one for the, the content that I've seen, the tweets that I've read, and other podcasts that I listened to before uh, preparing for this interview. And yes, I, I'd love for you to, to share a little bit of your background. Like, for example, something that came up is this, that you started selling lemonade for a few dollars. And what a journey until the point you are at today. Yeah, so I, I started selling cane juice in Venezuela. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so cane juice, but it did have lemon in it. So technically, technically, there's some lemon in there. So uh, that was my first sort of ever business that I ever did, uh, selling cane juice in Venezuela. I went to Venezuela with uh, the idea that I had a job. And then when I got to Venezuela, I found out that it wasn't real. It didn't exist. So I was sort of stranded in Venezuela. I went out and sat in a, in a plaza, in a square, and I didn't really know what I was going to do. And then I saw this guy selling Tang, you know, that, that powder stuff that you put into it, like Kool-Aid in America. And uh, I saw him selling that. And I thought, well, if he can sell that, why can't I sell something similar? And I started selling cane juice on the, the Carretera Nacional, the national, you know, the national street or whatever. And uh, I did that for, for about eight months, nine months. That was the first, first thing I ever did. That's how I found South America, my first taste of South America. And, and ultimately, when I realized that you can actually make something and sell it, you know, and people will buy it. Yes, because you are very well known for, for sales. How How is that transition from selling the cane juice in Venezuela to starting uh, your Twitter account? Like, when what, what went through your mind when you said, you know what, I'm going to start posting on Twitter, and boom, you now have 139,000 well, followers today. Yeah, God, God knows how I did that. Huh? That's pretty crazy. But um, yeah, for me, I mean, I, I became a big fish on Amazon. I was a big seller on Amazon for about five, six years between then, these two things. And um, unfortunately, I lost a lot of my accounts to suspensions and then I would come back and then suspend me again. So I just, I just left Amazon. But um, yeah, I remember going on Twitter one day and I opened an account. And one thing I do is if I'm going to do something, I become obsessed with it and I just do it until it's really good. And then I get bored and then I go and do something else. So I'll probably be doing something else other than social media soon because uh, I just that's how I operate. I get obsessed with one thing. I go and do that one thing. And then when I get to a certain level, I kind of get bored and want to do something else. So um, I saw people on Twitter and I thought, you know what, I could have a big account, I'm sure. I'm sure I could, you know, and surely I can have a big account. And um, I just tweeted and tweeted and improved my tweets and improved my content. And, you know, I'm definitely not one of the best accounts out there, but, you know, I, I, I hold my own. Yes, I see. And and what was the, the motivation to that? Just to grow the, the account, to, to prove yourself that you could, be, you could grow a big account in Twitter? Yeah, I'm in a very fortunate position. I don't have to. I live in South America. I've been here for ten years, and I don't have to really worry about money. So just for fun, I opened it, and then I realized I could monetize it. So I started doing that. It's always good to get paid for your time if you can. You know what I mean? It's, it's a hobby is great, but a hobby that pays you is even better. So I just got good at it. And there are annoying things about social media. Sometimes I share something personal, and I have strange, weird people on the the internet almost in my life but that's my fault that's not their fault that's my fault for sharing so it has its up its upsides and its downsides but it's been fun and when you have a, a big social media following there's a lot of money there you know if you've got a hundred thousand followers there's a lot of them that want to give you their money 
you know, they follow you, they trust you, they like your information, they think you're a good person or whatever, and they're prepared to give you money. So, you know, it's 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 a very good asset. <laughs> yes, I see. What What's one of the ways that you see in Twitter that people try to monetize their followers that you don't like? And what's your approach? How is it different? So, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes in my four years. So, you know, sometimes I sold too much. Sometimes I sold too little. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've got a, got a bit of a cold. Um, so sometimes they sell. I sold too much. Sometimes I didn't sell enough. Sometimes I went in with the wrong kind of product. Sometimes I went with the, you know, the right kind of product and I didn't move quick enough. I would say that the best thing you can do if you want to make money on social media is, and again, I haven't mastered this myself, so don't think, <clears throat> don't think I'm the expert here, but um, is to sell without selling. Where your content is so good and so structured, similar to yours, Miguel, you know, where you have a sort of, you're explaining Paraguay, Mexico benefits, and I'm sure people come naturally through there and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in becoming an, a Mexican citizen or I'm interested in getting my Paraguay citizenship set up. You know, so it, it comes down to really to that, you know, selling without selling is really the best way. And for other people that want to follow your steps and maybe for fun or maybe for this to, to share their passion and make some money out of their hobby, what's something looking back you do differently besides selling without selling what's another thing you'd be like you know focus on this if you want to build a, an online brand like yours personal brand well one mistake i made and again this isn't a dig at any of my 100 plus thousand followers one of the things i did at the beginning that i think i wouldn't do now is i kind of tweeted more for likes than my than raw stuff you know what i mean and the problem is is if you tweet something generic like drink water or something like that you're going to get loads of likes on it okay. right you know it's a classic platitude or even me planted my own platitudes uh, six months to change your life whatever my, those are my platitudes right if they could have a trademark on them they would miguel i'll tell you that much and i tweeted those out and okay you're getting two thousand likes you're getting a thousand likes getting 1500 likes but there's very little value in there and you'll find that the accounts that have 5,000 loyal, hardcore followers that love what they're saying will be probably making more money than accounts with 1,000 plus where people just came along for a platitude or some meme or something like that. So I would suggest think about what it is you want. Don't mix the two. Yes, even though the humor is powerful because you use the memes quite a lot and also like jokes uh, in general in your content but this is i guess more for fun or is also a strategy well no, the, the jokes is good because it attracts the people that find me funny which helps it's when you post something like a platitude or a generic meme you're not really getting the kind of audience that, that likes you they followed because they saw a funny meme or they followed because you told them that six months could change their life and they got a bit of dopamine from that and then they hit the follow button when in reality, if you're looking to monetize, the best thing you can do, let's say, I don't know, you have a Facebook ads agency. If you just talk solely about Facebook ads, your engagement is going to be terrible. You're going to have 10 likes, 20 likes. You're going to get followers very slowly. But each like and each follow that you get is very valuable because they're not there for the, the bells and the whistles. They're there for the the actual Facebook co uh, ads content. They're genuinely interested in Facebook ads and Facebook ad agencies. So if you ever wanted to sell something to them, you probably could. Whereas if I try and sell something now, you know, from platitudes that I've tweeted in the past, you you end up with people going, "Well, I came here for the drink water. I came here for the six months to change your life. I didn't come here for this. What is this? You know what I mean? I have no idea what that thing that you're trying to sell me now is." So that's definitely something that I've learned over the last four years. It's not about follow. If it's if you're looking for money, if money is what you want, then go down that route where you just tweet actionable advice. And yes, your engagement's going to suck. Yes, you're not going to have massive amounts of followers. Yes, you're going to you're going to look out of place compared to other accounts. But trust me, money is going to be better. And also, you're going to have more privacy. You can still enjoy your privacy, 
because you're not going mega viral where people are prying in your life and people are doing this and people are doing that and you get more money. So that would be the advice I would have. If I could sit down with myself four years ago, I would have said, listen, let's just go a bit more actionable here and attract the right kind of audience, you know. And I have a great audience. I'm not criticizing my audience. I'm just saying in general, you know. Totally. And also this part of privacy, I like it. And this is something that I also wanted to bring here to this episode, which is you chose to live in Latin America for the last 10 years. And one of your bases, if not the main one, it's Paraguay, isn't it? Yeah, it's the main one now. Yes. What? Because you went to Uruguay, you said your tax residency, your banking in there, something that you post about, that it's very easy to have banking in Uruguay that make your life very easy compared to UK banks, for example. Yeah. Uh, supportive agents there that help you with anything money related and then you move from Uruguay to Paraguay can can you share a little bit about what made you want to go to Uruguay and then what was the transition between Uruguay to Paraguay when it comes to so with Ur yeah so with Uruguay I, I arrived nearly 10 years ago now which is crazy I mean it's gone so fast but this is definitely my favorite continent I want to make that clear uh, I I I do not want to leave here for any reason. I have everything here. I have no desire to leave. I had a good time in Europe this year, last year when I went, but I'm not leaving South America. It's amazing. It's just the best continent in the world. Like Everything you ever want is here, especially with online income now. It's just made it a no-brainer. So I, I had just become semi-successful. And again, to anyone listening to this, I'm not even that successful now. So don't even, <laughs> I'm just a fairly, I've done okay. I've done a bit better than the average person. You know, I'm hardly, I'm hardly Warren Buffett, but I did well on Amazon and I got my first serious tax bill from the UK because I'd never really made any money before. So I didn't really know what taxes were. I only had a shitty job before. So they were always just taken in England. They, in the UK, they take it automatically from your salary. I don't know if they do that in Spain as well, but they just, they just take it automatically, you know? Well, so they do it too. Well, in Spain, they're, they charge you between 47 and 52%. It's not automatic, but you have to pay or you get in trouble. You get but in trouble. Yeah. Automatically. That's, that's hard, man. Well, if you have a job in the UK, yeah, it comes out automatically. If you have your own business, you've got to file taxes. But so the bill was 45% and it was a six-figure tax bill. And I was like, what am I going to do? This is this is horrible. You know, this is – and my accountant said, well, as a joke, well, if you don't want to pay taxes, go be a resident of somewhere like, I don't know, Uruguay. Because they had just – in 2013, they just set up their their tax benefits. And he told me, I don't know, on the weekend or whatever. And by Thursday, I was there. I'd arrived. I flew all the way from Asia to Uruguay, stop off in Doha, stop off in Rio, and then came down to, uh, to, uh, to Uruguay. And I called my accountant and I said, I'm here. And he said to me, uh, you're joking. I said, no, I'm really here. He said, you are insane. You are actually insane. And uh, he told me that he couldn't help me. I needed to go get a local accountant. And you've got to remember, Miguel, at this time, now, anything you want to do or anything you want to see, you can go on YouTube and see it. If I want to go have a holiday in whatever city in the middle of nowhere, I can type in someone's done a, 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 a vlog about it. There was nothing. There was nothing online. So any assistance, there was no one on YouTube telling you how to do it. That didn't exist back then, 2013. So everything I had to do, I had to do myself. You know, the only thing you would find on YouTube would be like a, a commercial for Uruguay or something like that. You wouldn't find, you know, actual people. So I arrived in Uruguay, set everything up. They were so business friendly. And for me, they still are the most business friendly uh, country in South America. It's just how easy they make everything is amazing. You know, moving money, opening bank accounts, getting businesses set up, getting tax things done. You know, and every year for the last 10 years now, I get a tax bill at the end of the year for zero dollars and zero cents for, for my business. And I have to tell you, Miguel, it's one of the best feelings that you can ever have. I promise you that much, much better than 45% to uh, King Charles. 
Totally. It feels so good. And especially when filing the taxes, it's something like hiring somebody. I, I guess that in Uruguay, it's the same. You don't even need to worry about, you know, taking crypto transactions and these transactions and, you know, spend hours in there crunching numbers on a spreadsheet. You just like, right. here you have maybe a statement. I don't know what you send them, but I guess it's pretty simple, right? It's very simple because it's just proof that it wasn't generated locally. <coughs> as long as it wasn't generated. Yeah, as long as it wasn't generated locally, they sent me a thing saying, yep, uh, generated income for the business this much, uh, you know, tax owed zero dollars, zero cents. Beautiful. And it is, is it is it still easy, Lawrence, to set up a bank account, for example, now traveling to Uruguay as a non-resident, a non-citizen and opening a bank account there and just voila? Yeah, it's still easy. It's still very easy. Unfortunately, what happens is, and you'll find this will continue happening, is the world chooses a country to be a tax haven. That country has a couple of years of glory, five years, 10 years, and then somebody, you know, some country comes and says, we don't want you to do this anymore. We want to see this. We want to see this. We want this. We want this. So they used to have, Uruguay used to have secrecy banking, which it doesn't have anymore, which was amazing. And I remember I went into the tax office and the lady who set me up, lovely lady, because I went to a small town in Uruguay to do my my uh, stuff because the line in Montevideo, Miguel, when I arrived was massive because they'd just done it. So they said, oh, you need to go to the tax office to get your company set. And I went there. It was You wouldn't believe it. Every nationality you could ever imagine was in a line. Hundreds of people. And I said, I'm not doing that. It was like a weeks of wait time. So I went to a small town in Uruguay and I walk into a tax office and they'd never heard of this before. They had to learn as they went because it was new and no one had ever gone to that town to open up a business and, and become tax free. And she said to me, Lawrence, 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 uh, the UK has called for you twice. And I said, oh, yeah. What, what, what do they say? She said, oh, um. They, uh, they're asking about you if you're a tax resident here now. And I said, what do you tell them? And they said, oh, she said, I checked the rules. I can't tell them anything. I just tell them that I can't give them any information at this time. And I said, well, that's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Go on, a nice box of Ferrero Rocher chocolates. And uh, yeah, honestly, those, so the days of that are gone, unfortunately, because each country, and you'll see it with Panama as well. Panama had this glory era where your uncle and your uncle's uncle were hiding money without you knowing there. Do you know what I mean? Everybody was everybody was hiding a piece. Not your actual uncle, Miguel. I'm not accusing him. Do you know what I mean? I'm just saying. Your uncle and your auntie were hiding money out there. So they have these glory eras, and then they slowly start getting picked apart. And then it's a new country, which is Paraguay now. It's becoming that new country where you have another 10, 15 years of, of tax freedom. So, yeah, it's still amazing, Uruguay. Still my, it's still my favorite. Differences between Uruguay and Paraguay. You that you've been, you know, doing business in both, or living in both. Um, sorry, what was the question there? What's the difference? Yes, dif differences and what, what do you see pros, pros and cons of pointing somebody towards Uruguay or saying, you know what, Paraguay might be better for you? Okay. I would say that Uruguay is better for the tax stuff and better for banking. Paraguay is a lot more fun. Paraguay is a fun country where it's like a classic South American country. The people are really happy. You know, there's always something going on. If, you, if you're a young guy or even an old guy and you want to have a party, you want to go out, you want to go somewhere nice, you've got all that stuff here. It's kind of more that sort of style. And also, it's an up-and-coming place. So there's lots of potential. You know, there's a lot of ways where you can get things done the way you want to get them done. You know, it's a very business-friendly country in the sense that it's becoming new. Everything's new. So there's a lot of possibilities. Uruguay is a lot more chill. It's the sort of place where you would imagine an older person living, you know, relaxed everything moves very slowly there's not a lot of parties you know the old people go get their 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 asado on the sundays and cook their asados and stuff like that and everything moves really slow 
You know what I mean? It's not so much fun. So it's more of a serious place, I would say. That's what I would say. So they both have their pros and cons. They're both safe countries. If anyone listening to this that's abroad and thinks that South America is some big giant favela where everyone's shooting each other, it's not that at all. It's both very safe countries. I've, I've lived a total of nine years, eight years in both. Never had an issue, you know? Totally. What bank accounts do you recommend for Uruguay? Because you mentioned that it's good for, for banking. So um, what I would say there is I use Santander and HSBC. I don't know if those are the best banks or not, but those are the ones that I use in in Uruguay. And those are the, you know, the banks that have that uh, I've always used and never had an issue. And I have to say, I absolutely love my Uruguayan banks. I really do. These two? Yeah. Yeah. That, I guess, uh, Santander and HSBC, I don't think they are Uruguayan, but you mean branches in, in Uruguay, right? Well, the thing is, is this is the thing. I didn't realize this. So I have bank accounts there. And when I went to the UK, um, I was like, I want to do some things with my, uh, I said, I'm a Santander customer. And they said, no, you're not. So each country, that branch is theirs. Oh. So it is a Uruguayan bank. I see. Because it's like seen as a different enterprise. It's not, it's not the same. Got it. Same name, but totally different things. Yeah. You are not a customer of all Santander's all HSBCs of the world. No, it's just that particular bank that you that you're with. And I honestly love them. I really do. They're so business friendly, moving money, sending money, getting money, everything's so good and works. And you know, you see a lot of people now in Europe, they want to buy something online and the bank calls them and says, Are you is it is it you buying this? Do you really want to buy this? Yeah, are you and they've almost got to justify why they want to spend their own money. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, oh, I do want this. Oh, we're going to block it. Or, you know, you could have a bank in the UK or bank in America, you're doing business and the bank goes, sorry, we don't like you. you you're closed now. You know what I mean? So there's all sorts of different things that can go wrong. Never had an issue in Uruguay. And I've moved plenty of money over the last 10 years. I've never had an issue. So Paraguay is a bit different. I know Paraguay has some strange thing where you have to basically send your money to your account and build trust with the bank before they extend your limits. Uruguay, none of that. You open a bank account and boom, you're in business. Well, sounds very good. And also, it, it's funny when I talk to, to people who's been in, in Paraguay as well, for example, you or Dylan as well, when we talked about Paraguay, huge ambassador of, of Paraguay. Uh, we talk about Paraguay and it's like, but wait, Paraguay, Paraguay, it has just Asunción because the rest is just like countryside and there's not a lot going on. Or here's the question. Is there a place, Lawrence, that you're like, oh yeah, Paraguay, it's much more than Asunción. I enjoyed this place or there's something in there. Um, I mean, a lot of it's countryside, right? That's just a reality. A lot of it's it's countryside. I, I've I like San Bernardino, which is close to Asuncion, and I haven't been to Encarnacion yet. But a lot of people seem to enjoy there as well. I would say if you're looking for big city vibes, Asuncion's probably not for you. You'd be better off go if you want like a big city, like a New York kind of style thing where there's everything. You're better off going somewhere like Buenos Aires. Santiago or going to Sao Paulo or something like that. You're better off doing that. Asuncion for me as an old ass motherfucker is a good choice. You know, I'm in, I'm, I'm in my thirties now. I'm, I'm out of my party era. I'm a chill guy. You know, I'm, you know, doing all the stuff that I want to do business wise. I'm not really a crazy party person. I'm like a 55 year old at heart in a 30-something-year-old 30, 30 man's body, you know. So Asuncion for me is perfect because it's like the mix of a big city and a small town, like a countryside town, but with big city stuff, you know, great gyms, shopping malls, all the rest of it. So I'm a big fan of Asuncion. I know a lot of people come here just to do their residency and then they go and live somewhere else. 
I think that's a good choice for you if you're looking for a bit more fun, you know, a bit more availability. Correct. And then in Uruguay, you have more diversity, right? Because between Montevideo and probably the little city where you opened uh, the bank accounts and let's say Punta del Este, right? There's quite of a difference, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Uruguay is a very, uh, like I say, it's a small town country. So there is no, you know, I remember when I lived there, uh, you want to go to like, if you wanted to go like to a disco or whatever, you know, as you call them, as we call them over here and in Spain, um, you don't have many to choose from, you know, it's a handful. Same here in Asuncion, there's a handful, you know, if you, if you, so it's, and then the good thing about Uruguay is it has that beach. So it has Punta del Este, but then it's, the weather's not that great. But for me, I like using South America as a mix of everything that I want. So when I want to go for a tropical beach, I'm going up north to Brazil. I'm in Maragogi, I'm in uh, Porto Gigalinas. So if it's summer, I'm in Florianopolis, you know what I mean? So I like to use South America for everything that it has because it has everything. So you can just in two, three hours of flying, you can be wherever you want to be, whether you want lakes and cold or you want tropical beaches with the white sand and all that stuff, like it's a movie. You've got that as well, you know? Totally. Calling right now from Florianopolis and here life is, is incredible. Yeah, it's it's really gorgeous. And as you say, it's a short flight to Asuncion or to Uruguay. It's very, very easy. And you saying <laughs> the way you phrased it, you're living in a 30-year-old body, but it's all of a 55-year-old. Um, something that I liked from, from your content, and it's something that I didn't find in, in many other accounts. I, I appreciated you, you sharing it publicly because it's like, oh, cool, other people doing that. It's the lifestyle team that you created around you that you have a mate that you share, that you enjoy having a chef at home. Uh, tell us more about this lifestyle team. Who's who's helping you, you know, with all the things that you don't want to do? And when when did that start? What was the, the click in your brain that said, you know what, I don't have to do things myself. I can just hire people around me, not just in business, but also in personal life. Well, I've always had employees, but uh, this was the first year, well, 2022 was the first year, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where I decided that I didn't want to do anything. I wanted everything optimized and I was going to pay for that. So I have a driver now as well. So I have a driver uh, here in Paraguay and I have a chef and a living maid. And you're not, you know, all of those three together, you're looking at $1,500. That's all that is. So it's, Sounds amazing, but it's just $1,500 a month for those three things. Um, because uh, you've, you've, the, the, that's one criticism I have here of Paraguay. You know, the driving's not the best. So I didn't want to drive around here. Uh, I don't even understand how the rules work, to be honest. So I would much rather have a local that can drive very well, taking me around and all, the, all this other stuff. So, yeah, th this was the first year where I thought, no, I'm, I'm optimizing everything. I want the best meals. I want restaurant level food, but at home, um, I want everything done. And also I'm about to have a baby. So I wanted everything optimized for that as well. So the baby's, you know, grows up with that stuff. And I mean, it's going to be a nightmare, you know, uh, babies not, you know, not even here yet, already got a chef, a maid and a driver, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. We'll do our best. Yes. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Really interesting how you're going to uh, raise the ch the child and but before talking about this the the team you have around you how do you find them how do you bet them and how do you compensate them one mistake i made at the beginning was i, I hired people and put them in the position the best thing you can do is if you want a driver find someone that's been a driver for many years if you want a living maid find someone that has been a living made for ambassadors and things like that in, in this country. You know what I mean? If you want a chef, find someone who's been working at a, a good restaurant. And like I say, five, six hundred dollars, it's going to be a good scene. It's a good salary here. <coughs> I always overpay. So I always pay whatever the normal going rate of salary is. I pay higher to attract them. 
and then uh, you know they they don't have too much work to do. My driver spends most of the day waiting for me. The maid has a house to clean, but you know that's it. And the chef cooks three meals a day, so it's not really like they're working a lot. And uh, yeah, they're all very happy with their jobs. So that's, that's been one of the things where you know for for one thousand five hundred dollars, I have a chef, a maid, and a driver, so I don't have to worry about calling Ubers anymore. I've got a driver, I turn to get the car. I don't have to think about meals. I have restaurant level food at home and the house is is permanently clean and no one has to worry about that. So it, it's it's really what I wanted, just sort of like everything settled. Yes, and where did you find these these contacts? Like I used an agency. I would definitely uh, recommend you an agency. Yeah. Because yeah. it just makes it easier. They send you the best candidates and it's better to pay a bit of commission and deal with good people, you know. So I, I understand you also paid for speed. It took like how much time to get Sorry, to, uh, to these three positions? Uh, not long. I mean, I, I made a few mistakes, but a couple of months to get it all, all concrete and, and settled, you know, and then bam, you're, you're done and you don't have to worry about it. So I highly recommend. And again, it's one of those things that if you live in South America, you've got to be taking advantage of because if this was the UK or, was, or if I lived in New York, a full-time driver, a full-time maid, and a full-time chef would cost me, but all of their salaries together would be about $15,000 with taxes and, and 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 everything else on top, you know, maybe $12,000 or something like that. So, you know, uh, for me to for me to have that for $1,500 isn't too bad. Excellent. Finally, to wrap up this, this topic, what's a red flag? in each one of these three positions that you'd be like, this is a deal breaker. You find this in a driver, a mate or a chef. And also what something is like, look for this to ensure like quality or to ensure like this is going to work. Well, one thing I, lo I, I learned in this hiring process for these roles is really their attitude. Because if they've got a bad attitude or whatever, they live with you. Like I have, there's an area of my house for them. They each have a room, you know, like their own sort of area of the house. So they live with me. And even though I don't see them because they have their own area, they're still here. So I still feel their presence. I still hear from them. I still talk to them. You know, I, I still interact with them every day. So, you know, it's different from an employee. I think you should always look for a good attitude no matter what. But I think it's 10 times more important they're living in your house and they're, they're driving you or they're, you know, around your house. You want a really good attitude. Excellent. So, yeah, getting ready for... For the baby, all the setup, and when? When is the the time? When are you expecting the baby? Any minute now. It's gonna oh, be right yeah. now. Could have to pause this podcast and so, just go to the hospital. Yeah, just run straight to the hospital. Exactly, yeah. could be any minute now. Um, yeah, literally yeah. It could be before this podcast is released. It probably, I'll probably, probably be here. So, wow, exciting. Yeah, how's how's been? Because it's the first one, right? Yeah. Yeah. One thing I'll say is yeah. you really go and see, because as a European, we're raised on the belief that, look, give us half your money, you know, give us half your money and we'll give you free health, free health care, right? It just goes to show it's a little complete farce. So I paid $2,000 here and I've got the best of everything, the best nutritionist, the best help, five-star birthing suite, this, 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 I have everything. So, you know, it really goes to show that free health care really is a myth two thousand dollars i have the like i'm not talking about average stuff me the best of everything and when you say two thousand dollars it's like everything included the whole package is two thousand dollars two thousand dollars <laughs> and then people when i said this on twitter people say oh but they don't make two thousand two thousand dollars there is like twenty thousand dollars here so first off no it's not and second off you know it's if you compared it to people's salaries, you know, if, if you're in the United States or something and you wanted this, it'd be $200,000 easy, you know, for all of this stuff. You know, the best of everything, the best doctors, the best, you know, everything, you know, whatever she needed during this period, she got, you know, $2,000. And if I lived in the UK, I would pay two, $300,000 in tax every year, which would cover my free health care. And then, you know, I, it would be that. So instead of paying three hundred thousand dollars, because people always say that to me when I talk about moving to Paraguay, they go, "Oh, but what about healthcare?" Just goes to show two thousand dollars for that to be covered versus 
three hundred thousand dollars what the UK government would take from me each year if they could. Totally, totally. You know I mean? The other one is the taxes are for the road. It's like, oh well, yeah, that's a we pay zero percent taxes in Paraguay, or like even the the people who make money there, it's a ten percent tax for money made in Paraguay, and the roads are are fine, are okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Healthcare, I mean, the world, all these I went things. back to the UK recently and the roads were terrible. So, yeah, and you pay 45%, right? I don't know what they've been spending that money on, Miguel, but it's certainly not going to the roads. I can tell you that much. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So, the roads to being a, a dad, how, how is that shaping you, Lawrence? Like, from the moment you, you knew you were expecting a, a child with your woman, how, how's the journey? How's been these nine months for you? Um, it's been good, I think, because I'm in a good place and I have everything settled and I have a very good setup and, uh, you know, I, it's all gone very smoothly. It's all gone very, very smoothly. And here as well, it's just so much easier. Like if you want, it really shocked me when I went back to the UK recently and I ate the food and it doesn't taste real. You can just tell that a lot of it's genetically modified or it's not real. And a lot of people in the UK, when I say that, go, no, it's real food. How can you say that? Go to South America or Asia for three months and then come back and you'll say exactly the same thing. So in terms of nutrition, which I'm a big believer in, you know, I'm not so science crazy. I'm more nutrition crazy and getting the best of things. You know, in terms of getting great nutrition and getting great setups, it's been easy. If I was in the UK, for me to get organic vegetables that were real and get organic food and organic meats and whatever – be a nightmare you know it would be an absolute nightmare absolutely yes i studied nutrition just like some fact uh for years a college degree on that and i can tell the the diet that i could follow when i was living in paraguay was sensational it was so healthy the meat for example it's high quality like first class meat and everybody who's been there says the same cheap prices very affordable and you can eat very very well in in paraguay and the same many places in latin america i just like yes what lawrence is, is sharing here it's absolutely true life here it's and you're here from spain right yeah yeah spain i mean spain is good but not as good as here i can tell well, I that's pre- interesting because spain, spain has some of the best food in the world right they produce a lot of fruit and vegetables especially yeah yeah yeah, and, and also just in terms of food and, and cuisine and culture of eating, Spain has one of the best ones. Yes. And if you're able to come out here, I mean, it's easy for me. I come from the UK. Do you know what I mean? We've got some, it can only get better. It's not getting yes. worse. Do you know what I mean? The weather the weather is only going to get better. The women are only going to get more beautiful. The food is only going to get better. You When you leave the UK, you're really starting at the bottom rank. You've got a great passport, a great accent, but you're really starting from the bottom rank you know what i mean and everything becomes better it can it can't get worse do you know what i mean so then from there it's easy for someone like me to come out to south america and live because like i said what else would i be doing eating cold beans you're spanish you've got some of the best cuisine in the world and you're able to come out here and adapt so it just goes to show the food how good the food is you know yes i agree spanish food is really good i can tell you when i went to oaxaca mexico I almost wanted to cry for like <laughs> the flavor of those dishes, man. It's the place of the world that I'm like blown away. They told me they have like world's awards, like global awards for the food in Oaxaca. And it's like, okay, okay, it must be good, but let me go and try it. God damn it. That's another level. I mean, Spain is good. Oaxaca, it's it's the, the capital of the world, I would say, regarding to food. Like short, short answer, like brief answer. What's what's your favorite uh, food place in the world? Which one? Okay, so I mean, Spain is in there for sure. I love Spain. Spain. I remember I walked past. I mean, obviously I didn't go in there to eat, but I walked past McDonald's in Spain and I saw they had Serrano ham with olive oil. I mean, you're not you're not getting that anywhere else. Do you know what I mean? Everyone else is McDonald's. Uh-huh. So- they're serving, you know, asshole burgers or whatever. You yeah. guys are eating serrano ham with olive oil and fresh yeah. ore- or- or- oregano. Oregano, you say in English? Or- oregano? Oregano, oregano, yeah. Oregano. You know, yeah. you're eating that stuff. 
Spain, as far as food, is is great. So for me, it's Spain, Italy, Greece, Paraguay for the meat. I mean, if you like steak and vegetables, which is mostly my diet, you know, this is top. And Uruguay, Argentina, south of Brazil, Paraguay, amazing steak. Then Peru is also in there because Peru has insanely good food. The seafood in Peru is just ridiculous. It really is. It's so good. Everything in Peru is good. So those would be my top. And Vietnam also. When I lived in Vietnam, they had very good food, Vietnam and Thailand. So those are probably my top countries for, for eating. I see. And going back, this bracket, going back to, to the parenting, where is your uh, woman from? Paraguay. Paraguay. Paraguayan. Yeah. And what's what's something you looked for in a woman to be the mom of your of your children? Um, I think the biggest thing for me was understanding the truth about the world. So understanding that we're at a constant spiritual warfare against very crazy people, understanding that, um, you know, there's a lot of manipulation, there's a lot of things that aren't normal, that we're told every day that is normal, should, but, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So someone who was awake to that was very important to me. And then obviously someone who'd be a loving, caring mother and, uh, She ticked all of those boxes, so so there you go. And what about the deal breaker? You'd be like, if you find this in a woman, run for rest, run. I just think uh, I think the biggest red flag in a woman really today is a modern woman. You can't get you can't get any more red flags than a modern woman. You know, someone that is watches Netflix and believes everything they're told on there to be normal. I mean, you that that for me would just be. I I wouldn't bother. I would rather be single than uh, than settle down that way. You know, a woman that um, just anything that society deems normal, she believes is normal. You've got no chance. You really do. You need a woman that has traditional values, or at least is prepared to embrace them. You know, I think that's a very important thing. Examples of traditional values. You know, uh, thinking that the family unit's important, respecting the man she's with, um, really just the basics that used to be normal and now are special. You know, the bar's gotten so low. But that's what I would say as traditional values. Got it. And how are you planning to educate, educate the, the child? By the way, it's going to be a, a boy or a girl? It's a boy. A yeah. boy. How are you going to educate the, the boy? What's something you already are very, very clear both of you well there's there's five very good private schools here so i'll go have a look at those but also i think homeschooling will be a big thing and a lot of education will come from you know i'll teach him the actually important things you know forget how many sunsets mars has a day and all that all that shit you know sales marketing tax avoidance you know <coughs> all the important stuff he'll get from me and his mother for sure, you know, and then school will be more of a bonus. And then if school starts, I mean, God knows what schools will be saying when he's old enough to go, <laughs> you know, they'll probably be teaching all sorts of horrible things that you, you wouldn't want your kids learning. So I'll see what the school situation is at that time. If it's, if I can see one that's perhaps a Christian school or something like that, I'll probably send them there. If not, then it would just be homeschooling. Yeah, because that's the thing. What? How about sending the boy to a school and then realizing that he's being taught something that you don't agree with? But on the other hand, you might not want the responsibility or the time, you know, commitment of being with the with the child twenty four seven. Yeah. How do you manage? You know, like if, if they're private, teaching private him, teachers, maybe maybe at home. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Private teachers or, you know, I'll get the curriculum and I'll, I'll find a way. But, yeah, I'm very weary of schools, modern-day schools. I see. I also saw that you are going to teach the, the boys some boxing and some martial arts or some fighting, right? Yeah, I'm not a great martial artist. I'm an okay boxer, so I'll teach him some boxing for sure and, um, and send him to a martial arts school and... Uh, You know, take him to Brazil, which is not far from here for jiu-jitsu and all the rest of it. And, uh, 
you know, just just give him the best of everything. And whatever he decides to go down, whether it's football or it's business or whatever, just give him the best support network that I can, you know. I see. I like that when we are talking, you are very clear. It's the, the level of self-awareness that you've got. It must be probably hours and hours and hours of of writing, Lawrence, of like thinking, critical thinking, writing, reflecting. Is that right? I'm not sure where that comes from, to be honest. I wouldn't know. I think uh I think, yeah, I guess one one good thing about Twitter is is it I'm accountable all the time for what I say for how I say it, for what I do, for the jokes that I make. Because of like, you know, so you, and even if you say something perfectly normal, people can get upset and offended just because, you know, something about it, it wasn't even offensive. Or there've been times where I've tweeted and people have gone, oh, you mean this? And I didn't mean that at all, but it came out that way in their mind. So yeah, very conscious of that, I guess, because you have to be. I see. So, you know, how are you going to be perceived? Well, public not... accountability yeah I see. yeah because twitter is the ultimate public accountability you know i put up a photo of myself a year and a half ago and my legs were skinny and obviously the anon people they come through your legs are skinny yeah you've got some muscle but your legs are skinny your legs are terrible and i work three times a week on my legs for the last year and they're grown now they're big but if i didn't put them out there i never would have been that's what i like about twitter i get criticized and that's the quickest way to grow it hurts And you go, oh, I can't believe they said that. But then a bit of time goes by and you go, yeah, that maybe they're right. You know what I mean? And then you start working on those things and you start fixing them. So I've been accountable in the public domain the last three, four years. So I guess it makes you a bit more conscious about what you're saying and how you're saying it. Totally. And out of this self-awareness that you got or also all the experiences that you've lived in your life. Again, we started the, post, the podcast and something that I see you very versatile, like you've tried different things, you've excelled at something, got bored, next one, excelled, got bored, next one, which at the end, I, I, I want to know a bit more about what's the next one after Twitter. But before getting there, what are some rules that you live by? And when I mean, when I say rules, I mean quotes, mantras, beliefs, something that is Lawrence, DNA or something that helps you take action or decide? That's a great question. One thing I would say there is, is I have to, and whenever I go away from this, something goes wrong. Whenever I do, I have to train twice a day, one weight session and one cardio session every day. And I have to make money every day. If any of those three things doesn't happen, something bad happens. I gain weight. Do you know what I mean? I slip out of a pattern. I stop making as much money because, and again, I have this, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse when you don't really need money because if I don't make money for the next six months, it doesn't matter. So then you have to keep that hunger. So those three things for me, train twice a day, wait in the morning, make money, running in the evening. If I don't do those three things, then I slip away. And especially at my age now, I'll get I'll gain weight very quickly. I'll get fat very quickly or my mental health from not making money, because when you're making money and you even if you don't need it, when you're making money, you feel good. There's dopamine that you're doing something, you're producing something. If I don't have that, my mental health will go. And then my mental health will also go from not training twice a day. So, yeah, train twice a day and make money every day. It's like kind of like my mantra. Good one. Good one. Definitely training twice a day as well. I train Muay Thai in the morning, running or weight training in, in the evening. And it just yeah. shapes you differently. The one about, yeah, about mo- yeah, the one about money is what if one day you don't make money or like you feel you didn't, you, you weren't enough. Does that cross your mind? Is it something you'll battle? Yeah, so there, of course there'll be days where I don't really make any money. I always make some money because I have different businesses, right? So there's always some money that come in. Obviously, there'll be days where I make a couple hundred dollars. There'll be days where I make ten, twenty thousand dollars in a day, right? It depends really on the day. I don't really say make money every day, but as long as I've done productive things so that money comes that day, be it sending out emails, be it doing this thing or getting this product launched or getting this done or getting that. 
then that's fine because you you're not going to have money every day so you can't you know you can't go out and beg for money when you've not had a great day do you know what i mean so you have to understand there will be days where you don't do that but as long as i'm on that path and as long as i'm accountable and i have a big white sa- uh, sales board in front of me which tells me exactly how much money i've made each day and how much of money how much i've made at the end of the month and what i'm doing and all the rest of it so i keep a very high accountability of all that stuff so now you're making money with these businesses you have the twitter account now is the time for the question what's next what do you think is so going love, next for I'm with agent i'm in love with agencies now so my biggest focus over the next five years i have a coffee brand so i would like to see that coffee brand become a very big one in america that would be amazing i'll be working towards that um it's been a bit difficult because i wanted to be on amazon but through my suspensions from amazon i've had I've struggled to get it listed because of who i am i must be on some sort of blacklist or something uh, but i'll be working on that and then agencies lead generation i absolutely love lead generation it's one of the things i've been i've been doing two years now lead generation and uh I absolutely love it. I just love selling. My favorite thing to sell really is leads because you're selling money to businesses, you know. Yes. And for the ones asking, what's the brand of the coffee? Raging Bull Coffee. They can Raging find it. They can find it on the Twitter. Yeah, Raging Bull Coffee. So that was uh yeah, that's if you if you want really strong coffee, you're a big coffee fan, you live in America, grab yourself some Raging Bull Coffee, ragingbullcoffee.com. And uh yeah, that's that's basically my two biggest things for the next couple of years. And then just keep social media ticking over, but kind of become less active, I guess. Getting to the end of the pod, of this podcast, we have the question that we always ask that I'm gonna keep it for the end. But before that question, that you already know which one it is, what's what's something you'd like to to share? with people listening to this podcast, people who's been you know, spending the last 50 minutes with us and it's really like connected with this episode. What's something you, you'd like to share with the world? Imagine you have, you know, this 10 seconds, a billboard appears in the middle of uh, Paraguay in Asuncion and you can put whatever uh, you have there. Right. Make Lawrence write or say in there. I would say the best piece of advice I can give Miguel is no matter how, no matter how we, you should go and shape your life the way you want to shape it. I'm as dumb as hammers. I'm as dumb as a bag of hammers. Complete moron. And I've managed to carve out my dream life for myself, where I'm tax-free, living life on my terms, doing the things I want to do. And I'm an idiot. Do you know what I mean? So don't think that because, you know, you're, you're you know, don't wait. Go and carve the life you want for yourself as quickly as you can. Because I'm not supposed to be living the life I'm living now. I will, on paper, I wasn't supposed to be living it until I was 60 odd and I'm retired. And then I can, you know, and I've been here 10 years now doing this. Do you know what I mean? On my terms, doing things the way I want to do it without paying any tax. And again, it's not because I'm so brilliant. It's just because I went and did it. So that would be my best piece of advice. Go carve the life out. Write down your dream life whatever it looks like. It could be that you want to surf every day. That's your goal. You want to have a sort of life where you can surf every day. And then think about how, what the steps, break it down of what you've got to do to get there and go do it. And you can do it, literally. 28 years old, no, 27 years old I was um, when I first, 26, 26 years old when I first became tax-free. And I'm done now. So God knows how dumb I was then. But I still managed to do it again. So there you go. Do you rely or is it something important to you, the a circle of like-minded people around you? Is it something you yeah, I know. in your life you can't on? That's you? one thing I will say, actually. That's one negative if you're thinking about coming to South America and Asia. South America is not as bad as Asia, but because it's cheap here, you generally tend to attract the expats that are doing online business. Not all, of course not all. But a large majority are going to be low income expats, you know, that make a few thousand dollars a month freelancing or whatever, right? By nature, because if you're looking to build a circle, and that's what Dylan Madden did, and I don't criticize him for it, I would have done the same thing in his position. 
he's gone to Dubai. He was living here and he's gone to Dubai because he can build connections, hang out with people that are doing three, four million dollars a month and grow himself that way. In South America, you really don't have that. And if you do have that, you're very lucky. So the best thing you can do if you do live on South America is have a very strong online community where you're held accountable, where you do meetups, where you're in Telegram groups, getting all the information, comparing results, because I didn't have that when I came out here. I was on my own. When I came out here in 2013, there was nothing. So I was doing my Amazon business and I had nothing. <laughs> no help whatsoever. So if you can get that support network elsewhere, do it. If it's money, I would say go to Dubai or something like that instead of here. You'll still be tax free and you'll be able to make, you know, much better connections. And how do you you craft the circle around you? How what's your favorite way or yeah, the, the better the best way you found in these 10 years of creating this A player circle? around you how did you connect I would, just, I would just say online it's it's very difficult over here to create a circle i have, do have friends here who i like and everything and, but in terms of creating a circle locally you know arriving in somewhere like paraguay and, and trying to build a circle of expats is a very difficult feat i would say if you're going to live out here in south america keep your online community strong travel to meetups do all that stuff you know Totally. So this is the wrap up for this episode. It's been a lot of topics, uh, really generous. Thanks for your generosity, sharing all this information about business, about your life, about your experience. Like the most valuable thing is that you talk from experience, Lawrence. It's not just something you read, but something you lived, something, you know, you went from sugar cane to, you know, having a driver, a chef, a maid, expecting a baby anytime right now, you know, and, and carving your, your life. Had fun. I had fun on this episode. And I would love to invite somebody that you have in mind. So the question is, who do you think would love to be in this episode? Or who do you like to, to come here to the show that I interview next? Another great guy who's been in South America for a while is Jake Nomada. Jake Namada is uh, is a great guy, and he's been in South America for a long time. So he would be a good one to interview. I think you've done Dylan Madden already, right? No, I haven't. I recorded the book. And he Have spent you? some time. He's lived in Brazil, Colombia, Paraguay, Mexico. So he's he's got some good takes. Um, but uh, yeah, those two I would say would be good for you to to interview next. Excellent. I'll I'll reach out. I'll let them know that you mentioned them in this episode and thanks for being here for your time for your generosity for sharing all this with the audience and how they can how people can find you besides twitter which is lawrence king and raging bull coffee everything's going to be linked yeah, so below. yeah twitter, twitter is at lawrence king yes at yo and instagram is at lawrence king yes so follow me on either of those platforms and uh look forward to seeing you there Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here, for staying here until the end of this episode. Expect more extraordinary guests coming soon. And until then, enjoy. As Lauren said, create your life, do these things every single day. And I'll see you soon. Adeu.